We're going to talk about Kubernetes. Kubernetes, this is the, uh, the title that I can get in on time uh, for the CFP, so I have to stick with it. <laughs> you know how that goes. All right, so let's share my screen. Come on, here we go. Uh-oh. There was a Linux user up here before, and the projector's now confused. All right. It's Linux con, isn't it? Damn it. All right, I think we're good. Yep. Cool. This is called prep work right here. All right, I think we're ready. All right, we're going to talk about Kubernetes. Internet access. This is not going to uh, end up well for these live demos. <laughs> All right, good. All right, so we're going to talk about Kubernetes today. And most people into the Kubernetes community these days look at Kubernetes and say it's overwhelming, right? We're talking about all of these uh, distros, platform as a service, container as a service. There's this new thing, container as a service. And most people do not understand Kubernetes. And it's really intimidating for someone to come in and attempt to understand it. How many people here feel like that when it comes to Kubernetes? A lot of people here. So when I think about Kubernetes, I always think about the API server, right? Understanding the Kubernetes API server and the objects that you store in the Kubernetes API server, in my opinion, are the key to actually understanding what Kubernetes is all about. It represents the contract between you, the developer, and the infrastructure. The objects that we model in Kubernetes, they all have some form of a contract. There's controllers that interact with those objects in Kubernetes, but understanding them is the key to understanding what is possible. And when we think about Kubernetes, we think about running workloads. And this is where the kubelet comes in. And that attaches to the API server and attempts to run workloads that are defined or scheduled to it. Now, for some people, this could be the smallest Kubernetes cluster that you actually have. Right? You're going to be missing some features. But with this, you can actually create objects in the API server and manually assign them to nodes. This will totally work. right? But that will be pretty tedious. The next phase is to add this idea of a scheduler. And the scheduler allows us to automate this idea of taking those objects from the API server, mainly pods, and assigning them to the nodes. And then we add on other components like the controller managers responsible for all the control loops that implement um, or actually put into work the things that you define in the API server. And then we have kube proxy. Now, to me, this is debatable. Is this a core thing in Kubernetes that you actually need to understand? There are parts of Kubernetes that I look at as training wheels. They're only there to ease your adoption of the platform, but they aren't 100% required. So over the years, a lot of people look at the stack and say, I have to go through IP tables in order to have one container talk to another? This could be a turnoff for some people, especially if you're sensitive about extra hops in your stack. And then we introduce things like DNS, right? DNS is really convenient because you do not have to rewrite your application to adopt Kubernetes service discovery. But again, it's training wheels. And then we have things like etcd, where we push a lot of the complexities of distributed systems into the store. And the next thing that we start to talk about in Kubernetes is, where's the container runtime? Most people say, isn't this the most important part? And in my opinion, the container runtime is a very small part of what you start to think about with Kubernetes once you start using it. And then over time, at least for me, it starts to fade away. You don't think about the container runtime anymore. Docker versus Rocket versus the next implementation that comes out. It just disappears, right? And it just becomes part of the cluster. So when I go out to learn the Kubernetes API, I think about forcing myself to remove some of the training wheels and what would happen. So if you wanted to do the service discovery in Kubernetes and we remove the training wheels, what is the contract that you need to stand in and do on your own? So I'm going to remove the DNS server and kube proxy. Now, start to think about how you would actually get two applications to talk to each other if I took away DNS and the proxy server. Is it possible? Right? A lot of people don't think it's possible. They think they're stuck with this. So I'm going to leave those things off and then talk about what I would do to accomplish this. So I have this package called endpoints, and this allows me to talk directly to the Kubernetes API, tell it a namespace and a service name, and just get back a list of IPs. How many people know you can do that in Kubernetes? It's totally possible. We have an endpoint that lets you 
have a curated list of all the healthy pods running inside of your cluster. So if we were to run Kubernetes, and we look at this, kubectl, get pods. So we need a workload. So by default, we need something to run. So kubectl run nginx dash image nginx. We need a real version. OK, so once we have this, we'll set up a few replicas. How about we start with nothing to see if this actually works? So what I'm going to do now is run my application that would like to talk to this Nginx service, but I don't have any pods running. But I'm going to bypass DNS, kube proxy, and just do it myself. So this is a form of client-side load balancing. So I'm going to create this particular workload in Kubernetes. And its goal is to come up and find the service and start doing its work on its own. So kubectl get pods, and we'll look at the logs for this. Wow, that's a lot of things. Whew. Let's adjust that. Kubectl apply. Got to do it live. No videos. Videos is like lip syncing at a concert. <laughs> if you see that happen, ask for a refund. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hit apply here. Whew, demo gods. All right. So now we have this running. So we'll look at the logs to see what's actually happening here. Now this is my responsibility. Let's see what we have to do. So we're going to look at the logs for this particular container. And we see that it's complaining that there are no endpoints available. So now I'm watching the Kubernetes API. And everything that we do in Kube Proxy and the DNS server, you can actually implement by just using the API. So here we're going to actually run a workload to actually fulfill this service. So we have this Nginx service, but there are no endpoints. So kubectl run nginx dash dash image equals nginx 1.11. We need a port 80. What's that? A typo? You guys are my friend. You could let me type that out and be like, ha, it's not going to work. There we go. All right, so now it's deployed. And what should happen is automatically my application now removes the training wheels, and is able to fulfill the contract on its own. Now, this is important because when people ask, does Kubernetes work with F5 load balancer in my data center? You can take off the training wheels and build your own glue code. Now, the code for this client-side load balancer on GitHub is 300 lines total, and that's what's comments and documentation for the package. And this means that you can do whatever you want with Kubernetes in any environment. So the things that we ship by default, they're just that. They're defaults, they're suggestions, they're easy arm ramps for people, but you're not locked into Kubernetes. And the next thing that we do is once we put these things back, we put them there to ease the adoption of Kubernetes, but don't turn your brain off and think that's all you can do with Kubernetes. And now we're starting to enter this other dimension of Kubernetes, where we start to fill in the blanks with things like a package manager, like Helm. We're bringing things in like logging, so now you're assuming that you will have centralized logging for every container running in your cluster. And then things like policies start to get really interesting. And then we have things like metrics, storage, and more importantly, security. And you start to see these clusters take shape. But if you look at Kubernetes the way I look at it, it looks like something different. It looks like a single computer. We no longer start to think of them as individual components that you have to configure and tune one by one. And since most people don't think of Kubernetes as the single deploy target, we think of these things where we're going to create a bunch of YAML files. So many people are creating YAML files for the deployments. Don't be shamed. I will check your GitHub accounts and find your YAML files. Own up to it. So imagine we have this application, and it's a real application. It's called Hello Universe. Why is it not called Hello World? Because this is much bigger than the world, this Kubernetes thing. So, so go build. We'll build this application. It's a very simple application. We're going to show you how it works. So go build, and then we'll run Hello Universe on my machine. It's like, dude's dude showing me Hello World. There's a point to it, I promise. All right, so HTTP. So what we want to do here is just listen on a local port. We'll do 8080. And very simple app. I just want to show you that it's real. We'll pull it up. Here you go. I'm pretty sure InfoSec at Google is probably shaking in their boots that you see my corp uh, domain there, so I will close it. But you see it's a real application. Now, to get this thing deployed into production, you normally have to bake this into a Docker container. At this point, I kind of see this as an implementation detail, the fact that we have to put these container images. How many people wish you could just take your app and just say, hey, Kubernetes, just run this thing, right? Creating these container images seem like an unnecessary 
intermediate step that I'm just doing repeatedly just to have Kubernetes run my workload. It's there for a reason, but I think we can make it go away. So in a normal Kubernetes world, what we end up doing is we build a binary for, for Linux in this case. So we build a, the actual binary, and then we have to make this, this Docker container. Now, I don't know about you guys, but my Docker files are pretty slim. How many people know what the Scratch container is? If you work in the enterprise, you're like, dude, all we got is Java and from the internet, right? Just pull the whole thing in as your base layer. And if you do that, you're more than likely you're going to get one of your dependencies and you'll be all good. So here, I'm just going to copy that binary in there, and then we're going to push it up to Docker, right? So Docker build, control R, Docker build. All right, so we're going to build this thing. We push it up, and then we push it up to some registry. And once we have this Docker container, we create the replica set. Right? So now we have this replica set, and we want to deploy our container in our cluster. You all know what to do here, kubectl create. And you think you're really awesome when you're showing people this, too. It's like, look at that. The container's in the cluster. And then we have this service VIP, and you show them that it's running. Right? I don't know why we love doing this. It's like YAML files, the oldest demo in the world. But we go here, and we want to make sure it's running. So great, it's running in my cluster. Everything looks legit. And you show this to your developers, it's like all those steps to get a statically linked binary to run in production. And the reason why we're still doing this is because everyone looks at Kubernetes as this collection of components where we just go through these workflows. But if you would think about Kubernetes as a single machine, we could start to think about it differently, right? Let's remove this really quick. kubectl, get rs, kubectl, delete rs, hello universe. I'll delete the other stuff so we can have some clarity here. So what I would like to do in the future, one day it should be possible to actually have my app be a little bit smarter and be self-aware of the cluster. All right, let's delete these as well. All right, so... Now that we have this hello world locally, wouldn't it be nice if I can say hello universe and just give it flags. Oh, let's build it again. Go build. I don't want to build a container, and I don't want to deal with YAML files. All I want to do is take my application and have it run in a cluster. So one day in the future, I think it's going to be possible that you'll be able to build your application. What is this thing coming up? Whatever. Just ignore it, man. <laughs> so it would be nice if my application was cluster aware. It would be nice if one day in the future, so this is kind of a fictitious world that we're talking about here. It doesn't really make sense. But imagine if you could say, I would like to run in Kubernetes, and you can say something like, I want five copies of my, or five threads or five processes running inside of Kubernetes, and you go and give it things like a memory limit. And it would be really nice that one day we can skip the YAML files, we can skip the containers, and we can just hit enter here. And then our app will like compile itself and copy itself into memory and put it in a location where the global computer could find that particular thing, hand it off to the kernel, in this case Kubernetes, find that execution point, and then hand control back to my application. And if it did that, what is this? Demos are not supposed to crash. But you know what? You got to recover. We're going to recover. And just tell the story again. You copy the application into memory. You hand control to the kernel. And the kernel goes and finds the execution binary that you need. And then it handles, hands control back to the application. It'd be really nice if my application could then fork off all the processes it needs to handle its work. And it'd be really nice if in the future I could go and get that IP address of my application that's deployed. And from my laptop, see that this thing is actually sending traffic across all of my processes, come back here, and see that my application is self-aware and it's deployed into the Kubernetes cluster. And one day in the future, you'll be able to hit Control-C, and you'll see all of the processes automatically disappear and clean up out there itself. And one day in the future, we won't be writing YAML files. And one day in the future, we'll actually understand the API. And we won't think in this procedural way of dealing with Kubernetes. We'll start to build applications that are self-aware, that deploy themselves, clean up, close your laptop, control Z, open it back up, and it resumes where it was. One day in the future, you'll be able to use Kubernetes as it's intended.
to be this globally aware application management platform without the manual steps. Thank you.